So uh, thank you, Brian, so much, and everyone at Google for having us. As uh, Brian said, I'm Virginia uh, from Second Chance Beer Company. We're incredibly thrilled to be here with you all. Um, if you'd asked me 10 years ago if I'd be sitting here speaking at Google today, I would have been like, no way. So um, just a question. How many of you in here have uh, had our beer before? Sweet! Oh my God, and that's even better. Okay, just for the record, a lot of people in the room raised their hand. I uh, <laughs> uh, want to encourage you all to ask questions at any time. Really want this to be conversational. Uh, we're going to tell you a bit about uh, Second Chance Beer Company. Yes, how the name uh, came about. A little about brewing, uh, and then talk about kind of some theories about beer and food pairing, and then we're going to go in and just do it. Um, Guess what? Marty and I have heard of Google before. So you're in good company. We each know each other. Um, and as I said, we're going to talk about us, beers pairing. And this is our second chance family, we call us. So you'll maybe recognize Marty and I. We do some fun photo shoots uh, at the brewery sometimes. This is our 80s themed photo shoot. Uh, Curtis, who's in the Star Trek get up hot pink headband, is our uh, third co-founder and business partner. He's our chief sales officer. He couldn't be with us today. Um, but it kind of gives you a feel for the culture that we try to cultivate at the brewery. Um, my background is I am a uh, lawyer. Never had any intention on working with my husband, but I'm really thrilled to uh, be the co-founder of a brewery now. Uh, I home brewed when I was in my early 20s, so I've been a big fan of craft beer uh, for most of my adult drinking years. Uh, and then when Marty and I met, he and our business partner Curtis had been talking about opening a brewery for a while, and so I finally volunteered that I could help. I, you know, had some uh, background in doing a business plan, and also had uh, knew how to fundraise, and so offered to get them going, but really did not have uh, any idea at that point that I would end up coming into the brewery. But lo and behold, I had my uh, out of, I have my offsite um, office at the brewery and slowly but surely I got pulled more and more into helping out. And at one point it became very obvious that we were growing a lot more quickly than we expected. And the behemoth that is Second Chance Beer Company really required all three of us. So. That's how I got to be involved, and I'll let Marty give you a brief uh, bit about his background, too. Well, thank you. Um, uh, yes, my name is Marty Mendiola, and I've uh, been brewing professionally now for, uh, I guess, about 22 years. Um, but I always worked for only one, one other company, and so when we originally came up with the idea to open our brewery, uh, the idea of a second chance kind of came up, and that got us uh, really thinking about the name. And then as we open, we, we, we learn more and more about how uh, fortunate it is. You don't always get a second chance, but when you do, it's a, a, a fortunate moment. It reminds us to be grateful uh, for what we have and what we're doing. And um, it all kind of started for me was, uh, I went to a school at uh, Chico State up in Northern California, Sierra Nevada is brewed there. So in the early 90s, it was still kind of a smaller brewery. That's where I first got the taste of uh, beer other, other than like your typical light American lager. So I, I just really fell in love with hops, started home brewing, went back to UC Davis where they have a master brewers program and um, uh, been brewing professionally ever since. Um, I, I come from a big, um, you know, big Italian family. There's a lot of, uh, of cooks in the family and um, so brewing is a lot like cooking. Um, you're creating recipes, you're, you're combining ingredients and tasting the end results and then uh, tweaking it, doing it again. A lot of trial and error in, in brewing. And um, yeah, I just fell in love with it. I love the beers quick, you know, you're talking maybe three, two to three weeks for an ale and six, six weeks for a lager. Um, and so it's a little faster than wine, waiting years. Um, so I got really um, just fell in love with the brewing process that way. 
So a bit more about our uh, culture. It's something I'm very proud of. Uh, my background is employment law, so I think a lot about how we um, attract, retain uh, talent and, and uh, about even a future. Um, so we have very progressive benefits. Uh, all of our exempt employees have unlimited PTO. Um, we do gift cards and um, I should say we do uh, anniversary gifts uh, at each of our anniversaries. Um, we do not really a formal bonus structure, but um, we do things you know, that surprise employees. So for example, our head brewer uh, was trying to buy his first home and he made mention of the fact that they were a little short on the down payment. So we brought his wife in uh, and sat them down. <laughs> he thought he was gonna get fired. <laughs> <laughs> and basically gave them the money that we knew they needed to in order to afford, afford that uh, down payment. Um, our ambassador of Awesome uh, was our first salesperson. Alex uh, was going to Greece with his girlfriend, so I reached out to her and told her, hey, here's this amount of money that I'm going to give to you, and please plan something uh, for you guys while you're in Greece. So she got them a really uh, uh, elaborate wine tasting and so just like to do things like that that are kind of extraordinary but also uh, are completely unexpected from their uh, point of view. Um, our whole family is also beer uh, Cicerone certified. Does anyone know what that is? It's kind of like the sommelier, yeah, for uh, beer so you can study and get certifications. You can go all the way up to a master, um, if you will. There's a couple, I think, only in San Diego right now, so it's, it's serious business, if you will. Um, but we pay for our whole team to get that first level of certification just to ensure that everyone um, is knowledgeable about the history of beer, um, various styles, and, and has you know, a reputable level of, of expertise. Um, we also do really fun events together. Uh, we've done an escape room uh, kind of uh, thing where we paired off into two teams and uh, you know, had a challenge as to who could get out first. Um, we do bottle shares and we're about to camp out at our brewery together. Uh, this is gonna be our next uh, outing. Right? It's impressive, huh? <laughs> Second chance. <laughs> <laughs> it seriously only took them six times to get that can through the basketball hoop. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> our drinker, Alex, uh, is the ambassador of Awesome that I was referring to earlier. Uh, and Ben is one of our assistant brewers. Uh, so they started this idea to, uh, they say, make beer fun again. And so they've been doing this uh, series for a year now. So literally every Friday, 52 weeks, they've come up with 52 ideas of tossing a beer, uh, Ben tossing it to Alex. So it's almost uh, the one year anniversary, uh, at which point they're gonna do outtakes. You can imagine what that's gonna look like. Uh, it started in the brewery and then as you see, it eventually uh, got taken outside to all places that are legal to have alcohol. Um, but yeah, if you, we, we have our own YouTube channel, so go check out Toss Me Beer. These are uh, all of our core cans. So we have five year round beers that we produce, um, 12 ounce, um, a couple of them have won some pretty significant awards. The porter over there, uh, the black can, is our tabula rasa. That's uh, Latin for blank slate. So again, your second chance. Has won back-to-back -back gold medals at the Great American Beer Festival. That festival is essentially the Olympics of beer. Uh, and no other brewery has ever won back-to-back -back gold medals at that uh, competition except for Firestone Walker, you may have heard of them. Uh, and then our Mulligan Amber uh, Ale had, uh, has won silver and gold back to back at the uh, San Diego International Beer Competition, which as you might imagine with us having over 200 breweries here is a fairly reputable uh, competition itself. It's international. There are uh, I want to say probably f close to a thousand beers probably entered. It's it's really intense. I, I've judged it a few years um, 
and, and it's very, very high quality. So we're really proud of that. In addition to these beers, we also do um, limited releases, so at least two every quarter that come out in package. And then we do probably two to four uh, draft-only releases every quarter. Some of those are very uh, small batch, extremely small batch, we call them, and you can only get them at our tasting rooms. So with that said, has anyone been to either of our tasting rooms? Yeah, this is totally making my day. Um, so this is our Carmel Ra Mountain Ranch Brewery and Tasting Room. So our first uh, location, this is our 12,000 square foot brewery and tasting room. 4,000 of it, less and less each day, is dedicated to guest experience. And I say less and less because we continue to grow our production and that keeps encroaching on what Marty fondly refers to as the most expensive cornhole uh, space in the world. Uh, <laughs> but that private event space uh, is uh, a big, attraction for us we we do probably five to ten private events uh per month so we are available for corporate events we do a lot of fundraisers in that space as well where we donate the space uh to charities we're family friendly um actually to the right of this picture that on the bottom uh we have a kids corner so kids are welcome uh parents Unfortunately, sometimes kind of drop them off and forget about them over there. Uh, and then we have uh, daily food trucks uh, as well. We're about to have our own second chance uh, food truck that's going to join us uh, beginning in October. So we're really thrilled about that. In North Park, we have what's called our Second Chance Beer Lounge. It's on 30th Street, uh, across from Toronado. Uh, so it's a 2,000 square foot tasting room. Has a really cute outdoor patio. It is both fet pet and family friendly. We do things like bi-weekly yoga there. Uh, again, a lot of fundraisers. And we just started a partnership with um, a food vendor here in town called Eat Your Heart Out. So everything uh, that you can eat hands-free uh, or utensil-free. be a little difficult to eat hands-free, but nevertheless, utensil-free. Um, so that's going to be going on uh, Tuesday through Saturday. We've got what it takes. My belief is really every day should be Earth Day and that's how we think about it around here. Really, we should all be looking for ways that we reduce our carbon footprint and treat our environment better. What can we do day in and day out to, uh, you know, be kinder to Mother Nature? So second chancing here at Second Chance Beer Company, giving things a second chance is the way that we do that. So all of these different, um, you know, ways of upcycling, repurposing, reducing waste that in our operations, in our brew house, and then the organizations and the charities that we work with is how we do our part day in and day out, not just on Earth Day. But we wanted to highlight that because of certainly on Earth Day and the weekend and the days surrounding it, everyone else is thinking more about what they can do for the planet. So as Marty alluded to, initially the thinking behind Second Chance Beer Company was, uh, you know, he and Curtis had collectively worked at Rock Bottom for 30 years and it was, well, you know, Second Chance is their opportunity to be craft and independent, call their own shots. But then it's also this idea that you know every moment can truly be a second chance, but you seize it and you make the most of it. And so what that turned into from the standpoint of business practice for us was upcycling, recycling, repurposing. So about 70 to 80 percent of our decor across both tasting rooms is basically living its second chance, if you will. Um, and then we also do you know different business practices. We uh, have a farmer come, he's a dairy farmer out in Escondido, comes and picks up our spent grain, feeds it to his cows. Uh, we do like water reclamation uh, in our practice. And then, you know, we've even sourced uh, hoodies that are made from uh, recycled plastic bottles and cotton scraps. We try to think of anything that we can to uh, reduce our carbon footprint in our daily practices.
We're very, very philanthropic. You may ha know th that the brewing industry generally is, uh, but I think that we kind of uh, go above and beyond. We have a goal that we set ourselves annually to do about 1% of sales in beer and cash. We do write a lot of checks. Not a lot of breweries do that. It's amazing when we give beer because charities can turn that around and make a lot of money off of it, but we also write checks from uh, charities that have fundraisers at our location. So this is just one of those fundraisers right here. It's um, what we've dubbed a parent night out. So a lot of uh, public schools have had, uh, if you're a parent, you know, significant cuts to uh, their budgets. And so they've had to start foundations in order to fundraise for laptops, technology, even, you know, uh, art programs and whatnot. So we will host fundraisers at our brewery and uh, the parents come and they'll do a ticket and we'll sell the beer to them for essentially like pennies on the dollar. And the, all the ticket money then goes from the charity uh, so that they can raise money for their foundations. That's about second chance. Now let's talk about beer. Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, as I alluded to, um, if you like to cook, you'd probably be a, a good brewer. Um, if you like to clean, you'd be a good brewer. Um, <laughs> Any yeah. yeah, so you know, it's uh, a lot of it's probably 60% cleaning and maybe even more with just preparation. So a lot of it is, uh, as you can see, it's all stainless steel, very expensive. So yeah, brewing is capital intensive. So if you have two or three million dollars, it's easy to open a brewery. <laughs> just get, get your equipment and get put it in place. And uh, then you can work on your like, you know, marketing and your and, and things like that. But you definitely need the money up front to have the right equipment. Um, everything needs to be clean. Uh, you know, we're dealing with yeast and uh, and trying to keep bacteria at bay. And so we're constantly uh, cleaning, sanitizing, and then we actually do the the brewery process, whether it's brewing or or. Uh, canning or kegging or something like that and then you clean up after afterwards so it's uh the actual brewing process can be a little bit of a, <laughs> a minor part of the actual day mainly we're dealing with um, um, malted grains in brewing mostly mostly barley um, but also uh, sometimes wheat or oats um, rice and corn sometimes um, and so when we're dealing with malted barley, we're, we're starting with the most basic uh, malt, which is in this uh, glass, which is uh, called pale malt. This is kind of the base malt for all beers. So even if you're brewing a, you know, a dark beer like a stout, still going to be 70% of uh, a, a pale malt with these other malts blended in. Um, they do different processes at these giant malting companies to create in this case, uh, caramel or crystal malt, uh, which imparts red and amber colors, but also some uh, caramel sweetness to the beer. So um, um, today we have um, three of our beers um, are over the line lager. It's a Munich style Helles style lager. And so it's mostly very light uh, 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 pale malts. So you have a very light straw colored uh, uh, color, crisp, uh, clean um, finish with not a lot of sweetness. Um, our, the, we also brought our, our Mulligan uh, Amber, which is an Irish style red ale. So it uses a lot of crystal malts to Im impart that nice caramel sweetness. Um, and then our Tabula Rasa Porter, which we talked about, has uh, some uh, darker uh, roasted malts, like chocolate malt. And these start off like this, like normal uh, barley, malt, but then they are typically roasted like coffee beans to impart this uh, nice, dark, rich, roasty color. So, you know, like some of the most famous stouts like Guinness, it's still, you know, 80, 85 percent pale malt with the uh, dark malts blended in to achieve that, those nice, uh, dark uh, flavors. And so you can see here on our little one barrel pilot system, we're, um, we're mashing in with a this is one of our friends who's a, a, a local chef, Chef Chewy. He has um, a, a restaurant down the street here in the Miralani district of uh, Miramar. 
And um, he was over one day uh, doing a collaboration brew with us on our little one barrel system. So he's, uh, the, 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 the uh, malted uh, barley is coming in with uh, hot water there to create a mash where we extract all the color and the flavor and sugar out of the, out of the malt. Um, our normal system is, in the previous picture, is a 30 barrel system. So when we're brewing on that, um, one batch is uh, 30 barrels, which is uh, actually 60 kegs worth of beer. Kegs are typically referred to as half barrels. Um, so it's a, it's a good amount of beer. We're kind of a good, kind of a mid-size uh, brewery. We, we thought it was, uh, you know, very, very big, but nowadays <laughs> 30 barrels is kind of a mid-size brewery. Um, this is uh, uh, on the left there, that's uh, Virginia and I visiting Yakima, Washington, where most of the hops in the, in the U.S. are grown. Um, Yakima, Washington, um, some in Oregon and Idaho. Um, hops, are, hops need a lot of uh, uh, sunlight and a lot of water. And so the farther north you go or, in, or south, because New Zealand and Australia also have very nice hop uh, um, growing regions. Um, so the farther away you go, the longer your, your uh, days are in the summer, and the hops just love that and just grow, 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 and they create these uh, beautiful uh, hop cones that are basically like the fruit of the hop plant. It's full of um, all kinds of uh, essential oils and um, very sticky resin, and that's where we get a lot of the uh, bitterness, but also a lot of flavor and aroma from hops. Um, no question, Jack? Do you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm just curious where you actually get your malt. So asking about the quality of, of our malted barley and uh, where we get it from. Um, uh, the bulk of our uh, pale malt, because we use so much of it and it comes in a truck load, uh, is, is grown in the U.S. and Canada. Um, and, and then we, a lot of our specialty malts come in 50 pi, 55 pound bags. And so we do acquire those sometimes from places like Belgium, uh, Germany, England, some of the big brewing uh, uh, centers of the world. Uh, but a very small amount of, of uh, barley grown makes it the, the quality for brewing. Most of it, uh, I hesitate to say the percentage, but I would, most of it goes to uh, feed, cattle, um, you know, other food products that might have like uh, flaked uh, uh, or like rolled, like rolled oats, but they also have some uh, flaked barleys uh, and cereals and things like that. But for brewing, it's, yeah, it has a pretty strict um, requirements on the kernel size and um, uh, other, other qualities like, a, a, you know, a, a having a certain level of protein, not, not too high. Um, the friability or how easily it's crushed can't be too too wet or too dry, so it is pretty strict. Um, a lot of times when we make um, uh, our IPAs, you know, we want it to be fairly light color, um, you know, that kind of straw or golden color. So you can blend in some more uh, what I would refer to as like heirloom uh, barley's, um, things like um, some famous ones are, are like Maris Otter. Uh, from England or, or um, uh, Golden Promise. And these are just uh, older, uh, more flavorful barleys that have a little bit more character to them, a little bit more flavor. Um, so it just depends, it just depends what, you're, what you're going for. You're going to, that's the cool thing about brewing is there's, uh, and that's why there's uh, so many breweries <laughs> that have popped up because there's really no one, one way to do it. Um, you can you can blend different uh, barley malts together in a recipe. You can play around with different hops. You can add them at different times. You can play around with when you're dry hopping, for instance. Uh, you can play around with how 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 much you put in, how often you put the dry hops in, if you circulate the tank or if you just dump them in. So there's so much variable out there. That's um, that's the cool thing. That's why you know there's different types of beer, but there's also different you know qualities of beer. There's some, there's some mediocre beer out there. There's some really kind of, uh, you know, uh, outstanding beer that really makes you like kind of say, whoa, that's, that's delicious. That, so there's a lot of little details throughout the brewing process 
because you know overall it's pretty easy to make beer. You create a mash, you boil it, you add hops, you add yeast, and yeast eats the sh eats the sugar and kind of creates beer and flavors. So it's pretty easy to make a mediocre beer, but it's all these little details along the way, the right time, the right pH, the right temperature. That's what really like can elevate the your your beer from. And same thing in other uh, you know that's why there's a ten dollar uh, or let's say three dollar bottle of wine <laughs> and a hundred and three dollar bottle of wine. There's different techniques, different grapes, different different quality. Um, but these. Oh. So in order to take your uh, your your home brewing recipes to kind of like the next level, or or to not just be following other people's recipes. Um, it's, it's kind of a balance, because when I first started, I was really into um, duplicating beer styles. So I really wanted to make an Irish red. I really like studied how, how they tasted, the kind of ingredients they used, so I could duplicate that. Or, um, you know, a German, a certain type of German lager, using, you know, the, the right malts and hops, but also the right type of yeast, maybe adjusting the water chemistry, because we have different waters around the world. Some are soft, some are hard. Ours is pretty hard here in San Diego. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 if you're going to really want to, if you're really thinking of duplicating a certain style, that's how I would approach it. I would, I would uh, you know, study the history of that, that region, and if I like that flavor, how to, how to recreate that. But now, we've entered such a, a, a crazy time where, um, you know, style is almost like beside the point it's like um, the flavor and um, what's new and what's exciting has become uh, the thing and it's you know it's difficult to come out with a new beer every every three weeks three or four weeks you know and uh, so even for me I after so many years I it takes me a couple batches sometimes to really like dial it in the way I really want it and uh, it's very very rarely do they does the recipe stay static anyway um, it's kind of you know, and, and your the the ingredients change a bit. The hops change every year. In fact, uh, you know, Cascade hop from one field can be different from Cascade hop from the field right down the street. You know, mile down the road. And so we're constantly kind of adjusting the recipes. Um, but yeah, now we've we've done things. Um, you know, uh, where we're adding ingredients I never would have uh, thought of in in the past. Um, some of our, w we use some uh, different types of uh, whiskey barrels and uh, rum barrels from different uh, companies, some from Cutwater down the street here, some from Kentucky. And, um, you know, used to just let the beer rest in those, in these spirit barrels and acquire the the flavor of the of the spirit, but also the, the oak and the, you know, after time, you start to break down the nice vanilla and coconutty um, flavors that can come out of the the oak, um, and that used to be it. But now we're we're coming up with all different ideas. Uh, we just recently made like the coconut macaroon version, where we toasted coconuts and macadamia nuts, and fin you know took the beer out of the barrel into a small tank and let that soak for uh, a, a couple of weeks with some coconut sugar and it turns it into more of a pastry stout at that point. But you have bourbon and oak, and it's like just big, complex flavors. Um, uh, but yeah, I think the bottom line is a lot of trial and error. I mean, I brewed, I brewed uh, an idea, and uh, and then we taste it, we, we talk about it, and then we realize what, what could have been done to make it better. Um, it's kind of a you got to stop that at some point because otherwise it's just a sickness and you can never enjoy a beer ever again. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, eventually, even if it's the best beer I ever brewed and I take a sip and I'm like, well, I, I get the look from uh, the staff kind of like, oh, gosh, never happy. So, but I think that's what drives. I think if, if you look at a lot of chefs, or for instance, they're always kind of just always like, pinpointing things and playing with things and flavors and you know I find it as fun I don't find it it doesn't bother me it's not like work it's like um, it's just really cool to, to, to play with these flavors the hops are are kind of cool it's just so there's so much coming out now when we were in Yakima we went to see they have um, 
Well, they have hundreds of varieties that they are grafting together every year. Um, but then coming up with new varieties every year, trying not only to have like best um, uh, disease resistance, uh, you know, from pests and things like mold and mildew, um, but also these flavor attributes and, and aroma that we love so much when you're drinking IPAs and all the hazy IPAs that are out now. Um, and so we were in a field here where these were like some of the very few out of out of several hundred, they weed down to just a, a dozen, and then they plant a row, and uh, then we're able to experiment with them. And, uh, and then every year only maybe two or three actually make it to market. They all have a name at first called um, HBC, it's the hop breeding uh, company, and they all have a name like 692, and eventually they become a, if, if, if brewers and, uh, like it, then it can have actually become a, uh, a commercial hop like Simcoe or Mosaic or Citra. All these used to just have uh, numbers, and it's, it's quite, quite fascinating. Most of the hops that we use turn into uh, the pellets. You can see on the right, Craig is dumping that into the brew kettle. And so what they do is they harvest the field, and all those hop cones are um, uh, dried, but then they're ground down through a pelletizing machine, which compresses them down in, into the pellets. And so it's a lot easier with shipping and handling. And um, uh, a lot of us think uh, that by running them through a pelletizer, it also is like ripping open the, uh, the, the resins and, and allowing that to be um, more easily uh, expressed into the beer. Um, yeast, of course. Yeast is, so you have flavors from the malts and flavors from the hops, but also about a third of the flavors does come from the yeast. And, yes? Um, doesn't need to, and uh, there, yeah, nowadays most hop beers have some bit of hop. Um, in uh, ancient times, all kinds of different herbs were used um, to f to uh, help with the uh, because otherwise the malt can be very um, sweet and sugary. So you needed some sort of bitterness to kind of balance that out. And, and there was all kinds of um, there's an old beer called Gruet that used to be made, which was made with uh, uh, yarrow and uh, uh, all kinds of uh, bitter herbs. But hops kind of won out because they're a little bit more pleasant and they're bitter, but also um, just uh, nicer uh, on the palate, nicer aromas and, and nicer flavors. Um, but you can have some beers that have very low, low levels of hops. But, um, but for the most part, that's our tradition right now. Um, Scotland I've, has beers made with heather leaves, uh, lavender, things like that. Hmm. And, um, <clears throat> well, um, the different hops that change throughout the uh, the season, um, they all come with a uh, you know a lot number, and now nowadays we have a um, what do you call it the symbol, and you just hit it with your phone and <laughs> a QR code, thank you, <laughs> and uh, you just hit it with the phone, and the analysis comes up, and it'll tell you what's what it is. So we can. Uh, every time we brew, we just double check because even though we, um, you know, have many boxes of, of hops, they might not all come from the same exact uh, location. Um, when you're small, you don't really get to go up and pick the hops that you like. Um, this year, I'm kind of lucky. I uh, got involved with uh, nine other breweries, small. And um, including, you know, like Gravity Heights down the street, you probably have been to, uh, and, um, and, and several others around San Diego and, and L.A., and we're teaming up to go up as if we were one company, because it takes 10 of us just to, to be big enough to go, and that way when we select, you know, uh, Citra hops, we can uh, sniff them and smell them and, and look at them and then decide, okay, we like number three, we want to buy all number three. So that's something cool that's going to happen for us. So we, we'll get a little bit more consistency that way. And we're getting the better quality, because otherwise, when you're small, you may be getting, when you used order, you may be getting the, the, the batches that no one, the, the, the lots of hops that no one wanted. And uh, so then we have to uh, 
you have to get get what they give you. Um, but yeah, I, I think the the flavors from the hops, the the malt, but also the yeast. The yeast is very important. We've been very fortunate to have um, uh, White Labs here in San Diego, and uh, now some, many other companies have popped up around the country. But Chris White was very instrumental in making a uh, um, you know yeast accessible to small breweries that didn't have major big laboratories, and um, it's called pitchable pitchable yeast. So when you add yeast to to the fermenter, we call that pitching the yeast. And the yeast typically has this kind of a look uh, on the on the left. It's a liquid slurry. Um, you know, the yeast is a single-celled organism that likes to eat sugar, which we extract from the from the barley, and it gives off the alcohol, which we like, and and keep that in the beer. Uh, the CO2, which blows off some, we we trap some as well to get some natural carbonation, uh, but also many other um, uh, esters and aldehydes that contribute to the flavor and aroma of a beer. So when you cut a green apple, it smells like acid aldehyde. Yeast produces that as well. Um, and so there's many different types of yeast. Some are very clean yeast, meaning they don't impart a ton of flavor. Some are much more um, uh, aggressive yeast, like a lot of Belgian beers. When you, if you ever have a, you know, a, a, you know, a Belgian beer like a Chimay, it's very complex, lots of pear and apple and all kinds of things going on that came from the yeast. Um, super important for me, I think that's what differentiates a lot of breweries from, uh, um, you know, mediocre beer to great beer is, you know, really taking care of your yeast. The yeast needs to be clean and healthy. Um, you need to have like a really nice, strong fermentation. You don't want a lot, you know, a, a slow, sluggish fermentation that's not it's just like us. When you're healthy and happy, you're you're performing, um, you know, much better. When you're <laughs> when you're sluggish and half dead, yeah, you're not going to do do too well. So, so yeah, we keep everything super clean. Really take care of our yeast, and uh, it's a uh, it's just a fun. And also water. We um, we forget about water a lot, um, but water chemistry can come into play. We don't get too crazy about our water uh, chemistry. Um, you can have a full-on reverse osmosis system and then build your water back up to where to where you want it it's also very expensive so we do some extensive filtration to get rid of chlorine and heavy metals and things like that but um, it's difficult for us to um, brew all styles of beer especially lager we have to be very careful when we're brewing like our over-the-line lager because we want a lighter or softer water for that and um, it's we don't have it in in San Diego so we have to be a little bit creative how we uh, how we deal with that. Um, that being said, even though that we do have hard water, we add a lot of um, uh, calcium chloride, calcium sulfates to our beers, especially with our hoppy beers, to um, really impart that nice uh, uh, hoppy bitterness. And um, the yeast also uses a ton of uh, calcium in um, to to be healthy and to reproduce. Yeah, I chatted a little bit about uh, some of you know, typically the two main styles of beer are ales and lagers, and it's mainly due to the type of yeast that we use. They're slightly different uh, uh, varieties and strains. Um, ales will ferment around room temperature, so around 68 Fahrenheit, and um, but they won't ferment uh, below, you know, into the 50s, whereas lager yeast will continue to ferment um, down into the 48, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And basically the warmer you ferment a uh, beer, the more flavors, the more esters and, and aldehydes are gonna be produced and you're gonna have a more fruity, flavorful beer. Um, uh, the lower fermentation, you know, fermenting a lager at, at 48 or 50 degrees, you're gonna have much less fruitiness from that and the, the malts and hops are gonna be playing more of an important role in the beer. Um, it takes a lot longer with lagers too uh, to make a proper lager because of the cold temperature. The whole metabolism, the yeast is slowed down. So instead of taking, you know, 15 to 20 days like an ale, a good lager is going to take, you know, 35 to 40 days at least. Um, some companies even pride themselves on having uh, much longer uh, maturation times. Um, the barrel aging on the on the right, you can see some of our barrels in the background, and they just rest in there and. And uh, we get them wet. 
they, after they uh, after they con uh, after they remove the, the the spirit from the barrel, the inside is still wet. We get them uh, right away. We try to get them within a few days, and then fill them with beer. It said I've heard rumors. There's something like two gallons of of uh, of the liquor still absorbed in the wood, and so with the beer sitting in there, it slowly pulls that out of the out of the wood, and um, it typically increases the alcohol content of, of the beer that we put in there by 2%. So we put in a 10% imperial stout, like that uh, coconut macaroon there, and it, uh, it ends up at 12% from the uh, increase in the, in the whiskey uh, uh, content. Do you only use the barrels once? Typically only once. Um, we do occasionally, if it's the timing is right, because if it's uh, if it's just left dry, it's going to bacteria is going to start getting in there, and then you can, you're asking for trouble. But uh, uh, we will do a second fill once in a while. In fact, um, next week our fourth anniversary is coming up, at, and we're celebrating at the brewery. Um, we're releasing a, a, a brown ale that we did a second fill in. So this is a small beer that's only 4.8 percent, but we put it in a whiskey barrel for a second fill. And it just just worked out in time that we were emptying the barrel and we had this beer available, so we're like, let's let's try it. So much less whiskey flavor, but um, a lot of uh, kind of ca uh, caramel, kind of butterscotch flavor from the residual uh, beer that was in there in the wood, and so it, it turns out really nice. But no, not like uh, typically with uh, uh, wine barrels where they can uh, steam clean the barrels and um, maybe use sometimes they use sulfur. Uh, strips in a, in a wine barrel to preserve them before they refill them again the next year. So now, yeah, not too much. This might be a dumb question, but why, why put the wood uh, here? So why not put the wood into the into the tank of beer? Um, <laughs> well, the outside is pretty dirty. And <laughs> um, yeah, they're filthy, really, on the outside because they they're sitting in a warehouse and and dust and the the rings are are, but you can, yeah. There's companies that do um, uh, chips, wood chips. Um, there's some companies that have come up with this some method of making these uh, spirals, so you can actually like stick the spirals down in into a tank or a keg or something like that if you have. So yeah, it is possible. It's um, it's technically it's illegal to. You, we can't add liquor to beer, but we can't add beer to a barrel that previously held liquor. <laughs> so that's that's what. <laughs> that's probably the main reason. Yeah. Yeah. So specific gravity is just a measurement of the density of a liquid, and so we typically use like pure. Distilled water is kind of like your your zero point, and uh, there's a couple different scales as well that makes it kind of confusing because the English like to use the specific gravity scale, which uh, pure water is 1.000, and then the more dissolved stuff you have in the liquid, it makes it thicker. That, that number is going to go up. Um, I we, we like to use, there's a couple other scales. One's called the BRIX, B-R-I-X scale that used mostly in wine. Um, uh, and I like the uh, Play-Doh scale, it's called. And they're very, very similar. They basically, 0, 0.0 is pure water. And then as more dissolved stuff is in there, the, the number's going to go up. And we use what's called a um, hydrometer where, where it's, you, you drop it into a, a, a test tube of your liquid sample and you, it floats. And so it would float at zero. And then when you have a, 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 you know, a liquid or a beer with more dissolved stuff, more dissolved sugars and proteins in there, then it's, it's going to rise up and it's going to float higher. So we use it as a way, this is how we, um, it, it's part of like the recipe uh, formulation. Uh, asked earlier so if you if you want to make a 5% a beer with 5% alcohol or a beer with 7% or a beer with 9% you have to have a different uh, starting gravity or original gravity so when we're um, using the the the, uh, the the malts to create a mash you can think about it think about it as we're always using the same amount of water 
So in our case, we're using, uh, it's a 30 barrel mash ton. So we're typically using about, um, uh, there's 31 gallons in a barrel, so roughly 900 uh, gallons of water. So we're always using the same amount of water, but we can add different amounts of grain. So the more grain we add, the higher, the more sugar we're going to extract, and so there's going to be a higher percentage of sugar. So the original gravity is going to keep going up. So a typical light beer that's going to be 5% is going to start with an original gravity in the about 10, 10, 11, 12 percent range, meaning about 10 or 11 or 12 percent sugar. Um, you know, a 7 percent IPA is going to start around 15 percent sugar, or 15 degrees Plato they, is the terminology. Um, you know, if you want to make a big 10% imperial stout, you're going to start at like 22 Play-Doh. And so we, we, we monitor that because as we're, as we're filling the, the brew kettle, we're also spraying hot water over the top uh, in a process called sparging. And so the, uh, the, gra the gravity of, the, of the, the liquid, what we call the wort, W-R-T, the wort coming out of the mash tun into the brew kettle, um, it starts out high, but then as we spray more water, it's getting more and more diluted, so this drops and drops and drops. And um, so we have a cutoff where we will not sparge below uh, three Play-Doh or 3% sugar. Because then you're starting to extract all the um, undesirable things out of the grain that you don't want. You don't want to get all the last runnings. You want to get all the good, sweet stuff. And um, so that's, that's one method. Then we know once the, the brew kettle is filled and it gets boiling, then we'll take another sample, check the gravity, and see how close we are to our target. And then sometimes we have to add a little water to, um, to kind of blend it down. And um, so then the, the work goes into the fermenter and we add the yeast. The yeast starts eating the sugar, creating alcohol, carbon dioxide, all the other stuff. Um, Alcohol weighs less than water, so we have to do a little bit of a calculation, but um, we ch essentially we check the gravity throughout the fermentation. And so if we make a beer with 15 Play-Doh, next day it's going to be at like 12 Play-Doh, and it's going to keep on going down until it finally finishes out somewhere in the low range, two, two to three Play-Doh. So if you're... Um, so yeah, specific gravity is very, very important. We're constantly checking it, and if, and it also just d depends what you're trying to do. If you're trying to make a, a you know, a light lager like our overline lager, we want that to be very dry, little, very little residual sugar. We want it to be light and crisp and, and easy drinking. So we want that to finish real low at like one and a half percent sugar. Whereas a beer like the, uh, the porter, you know, that's. Um, whoop, whoop. <laughs> It's got a lot more, uh, a lot more flavor, a lot more body to that. So that beer will typically finish around, uh, uh, you know, around 3.8 or 4 Play-Doh. So it's got a lot more residual, uh, residual sugar, more body, more mouthfeel. So yeah, great question. Thank you, though. So yeah, we love, we love beer and food combined together. Um, I always. <laughs> I just, I'm just fascinated by beer because there's so many, I think there's over a hundred official beer styles now. Um, and it just fascinates me that you can have, you know, a super straw, light straw colored beer, a sweet, you know, red colored beer, a stout, a hoppy IPA, and it just fascinates me. Sometimes when we, we like, we have some friends in Napa, we we'll go up there and we'll do some wine tasting sometimes and, um, you know, there's lots of different red wines and a lot of different white wines, but you know, red wines like you know, Zinfandel, Merlot, Cabernet, they all are kind of grapey. You know, you can always <laughs> you can always, <laughs> you can always like you can always make up the description like without even tasting it. Oh yeah, hints of cherry and and blackberry. You know, I always I think they think I'm an idiot, when, but I'm at a tasting room and I'm like, uh, yeah, it's really grapey. I like that. And, and they're like, <laughs> Okay, uh, I'm just playing, but, but it just fascinates me the, the amounts of flavors we have, and uh, we also enjoy a lot more variety. I think like you really can't do a lot with mustard and wine, but mustard and beer can be great, you know. Um, uh, and so we, 
uh, are just fascinated by it. And luckily, we have a lot of friends around town with a lot of a lot of our chefs that can uh, uh, do do wine and uh, wine beer beer and food pairings with us. <laughs> now I want to wine because <laughs> bad mouthing. Um, but the three main uh, ideas that we have uh, come across when uh, thinking about beer and, and food pairing is um, the ideas of uh, complementing um, and contrasting and c cleansing or cutting. Because, uh, and they're all, sometimes they can happen in the same dish, so we'd be interested, you know, after we, uh, we go and, uh, and try what we have uh, prepared, it'd be interesting to hear your, your thoughts on what complements what and contrasts and it could be the same, but compliments typically happen when, you know, as you might imagine, when the, the similar flavors and intensities of the food uh, combine to, uh, you know, to find each other, enhance each other. Um, you know, typically like, you know, a, a, a light, light fish, maybe a, a porter or stout is maybe not the best thing. Maybe a lighter, a lighter beer might be a, a long, you know, better pairing. Um, contrasting is kind of interesting because it can be. Uh, when elements can contrast, they can accentuate or heighten each other. Like when you have um, like salt and sugar, a lot of our a lot of our foods are have both to to heighten both senses. Um, but they can also be noticed. Um, they can also cut each other and 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 be noticed separately. So IPA is a is a kind of a cool one because you can pair an IPA with a hoppy bitterness with something spicy, and it actually makes it more spicy and it's not like a refreshing uh, combination it's more of a contrasting combination those are kind of fun um, and then cutting and, and or cleansing is kind of when that's kind of displayed when uh, 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 carbonation uh, the bitterness um, the acidity of beer can kind of wash away and and cleanse the palate from uh, you know uh, oily or or heavy or rich foods and it's one of the reasons why uh, beer and cheese go so well together, um, because they it, it helps to wash that 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 fatty uh, uh, cheese off your tongue and make you ready for the next bite. So, with that being said, I I think we are uh, about ready to give it a try. Oh, do we have one? Oh, we do have the menu. So we thought they um, we'd start with a kind of a more of a cleanse with the uh, bruschetta, with, uh, with an olive tapenade, and then the lagers like light, uh, crisp, bu bubbly, a lot of carbonation, and um, it's going to be a, a, a refreshing pairing. Um, things like a, uh, a fresh cheese with our mulligan, it's an amber, it's an Irish red, it's got a lot of caramel. Um, malts and and um, toasty flavors. I think those those pairings should uh, complement each other really well. And then kind of a kind of a fun thing. When I think meatball, I'm thinking you know, Chianti, Chianti or something like that. Uh, but the uh, the rich uh, roasty flavors of our porter with the um, uh, uh, you know higher higher sp uh, final gravity, more richness and 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 body and the flavors of the uh, the meatball are going to be very interesting together.